It's now my pleasure to introduce Kaveri Myra, who's a qual qualified in nursing, midwifery, and public health. She is a doctoral candidate at the University of Southampton in England. She has passionately worked on nursing and midwifery workforce development and governance, health systems research, quality and respectfulness in maternal health care, gender and women's empowerment. Kaveri started her career with an NGO called Academy for Nursing Studies and Women's Empowerment Research Studies, or ANSWERS, and she currently serves as a member on its governing board. She's consulted with a variety of leading development organizations, including the World Health Organization, JAPIGO, and the Public Health Foundation of India. She's worked in almost all of the states in India and includes countries such as Bangladesh and Thailand. We welcome Kaveri as our final keynote speaker in the 2021 VIDM. Kaveri, you have control of the slides. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just trying to see. Okay, now I see the uh, control of slides. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask a question before I get started. And I also would like to give a disclaimer that um, at parts, the content of this presentation is going to be a little sensitive. Um, it might remind you of past trauma you might have experienced. So at any stage, if you feel that, then um, given this is the only room uh, in the conference right now where uh, an event is happening, I think you'll have to step aside and prioritize your mental health if you feel the content is getting emotionally very, very heavy. Um, over the course of this presentation, I think you will mainly understand my obsession about asking people uh, their birthing experiences. And um, it is something that has happened over the course of last 15 years and how that has kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, happened and I have taken it forward is what I'm going to mainly talk about, which is why it's called the pursuit of honoring women's childbirth narratives through visual arts based research. Most of my work is from India, but um, I have asked this question to people around the world now, but most of it is not included in this presentation. So before I uh, go to the next slide, I have a question and um, I know you have already answered where you are coming from, but I just want to know wherever you are at, have you heard of obstetric violence? Do you think it's a problem in your country? So you just have to, in the chat box, uh, chat box put the name of the country and say yes if you think uh, it is a problem in your country and no if it is not. And I'm going to give like 30 seconds to that. The question is whether obstetric violence is an issue in your country. I also see the participation has increased a little. Um, India, absolutely. I can I can vouch for that. So I see most people have said yes. I am not seeing any no's here. All right. So I think the answer to this question um, already is there where uh, obstetric violence exists and um, what you're seeing in this map depends only on the countries um, i have read literature from and given the uh, uh, phd on obstetric violence i get to read a lot and write a lot and this map in no way suggests that these are the only countries where obstetric violence is a problem in fact, there's a, a high chance some of you may feel you may see your country there in gray and might tell me that I need to color it red. But the point is that it is quite a global phenomenon now. It feels diverse. There are parallels. And it's an issue that needs to be tackled urgently. And this is not just coming from researchers 
and midwives like me. But in the What Women Want campaign, which went to 114 countries, and it reached out to 1.2 million girls and women asking them just one question of what their key demand is for quality, reproductive, and maternal health care. The top demand was for respectful and dignified care, which clearly suggests that there is obstetric violence that these women have either heard of or experienced or are wary that they do not want to experience something like that um, when they give birth. Not just that, when you look at the other demands like water, sanitation and hygiene also shows uh, disrespect and abuse. Um, number 14, ethical, lawful, non-abusive and secure care. Women asking for that, there are indications of obstetric violence there as well. But this issue is very sensitive and uh, it's there is a, a denial that you uh, will hear in newspaper articles, in journals recently in South Africa, uh, Violence Against Women Journal published a few commentaries and uh, a paper that talks about how gentle should violence be for it to not be called obstetric violence. There, uh, There is one discourse in Italy about uh, a paper that reported um, women uh, reporting obstetric violence in a community health survey. And then there were uh, four associations, including that of doctors and midwives, resisting to it with a very strong language. So this denial is something that has also become a part of the narrative. And that is just one side of the issue. The other side is to understand this problem because it's sensitive. And I will tell you why. But it's important to know a little bit about my story and why I do what I do uh, before I tell you about that. Well, uh, this hazy picture shows me as a student here. And this is 2000, I think, five or six. I would have been 18 or 19. And um, that is when midwifery kind of showed up in my nursing degree. Uh, midwifery was embedded in it. And um, we were all, I mean, uh, unmarried girls uh, doing a degree course. And quite uh, unprepared, not in terms of theory, but in terms of more emotionally prepared to know what we are going to uh, experience and see. And disrespect and abuse, all kinds of uh, obstetric violence was kind of, you know, very normalized in the situation. And we used to observe it like every single day, sometimes not register and some extreme forms we used to register as well. But some of these incidents used to stay. And one of those kind of changed how I observed birth from then onwards. I'm sorry if many of you have already heard this story. But for those who have not, there was this woman whose name I don't remember. But she was under my care as a student midwife. And uh, the head of the department, uh, the obstetrician, he comes and he wishes to do a vaginal examination on her. And I was with her. I had taken her to a, a covered uh, area, even though there were a couple of people who had come in as well. Right before he would go to do a vaginal examination, he just roughly lifts her sari with his elbow and looks at her uh, genitals and, and said, how does your husband want to do anything with you, with the jungle you have grown there? And that even though wasn't probably the most extreme form of uh, you know obstetric violence that i had observed but it just kind of stayed with me and i had tried to resist that i had tried to file a complaint but not much happened and there were uh, challenges and i was supposed to face repercussions if i took it forward so this is around that time when um, I had kind of out of frustration thought that nothing is going to happen as a student midwife. I'm far at the bottom of, uh, you know, the power based hierarchy, the medical hierarchy. It's it's all very patriarchal. But I also realized that the nursing superintendent or the midwifery professors, people who I had approached, even they were not that far up on the hierarchy to solve something like that. So no matter how farther up you were going on a midwifery or nursing cadre, you, your voice still didn't matter. It didn't count. So my brilliant idea 
that evening sitting at the library was like I was in tears talking to my best friend saying, I have to do a PhD on this. Otherwise, nobody will listen to me. And 15 years down the line or so, that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm finishing so that people listen to me. And I understand that this whole presentation is now becoming about listening. Um, but uh, more about my uh, experiences as a student. And India is not the only country where student midwives face this kind of sexism. Um, and I have written uh, at length about my experience in this particular uh, article that came out in June on the Practicing Midwife Journal, if you wanted to have a read later. But the problem didn't end there. I had observed the issue, but when I moved forward in my career i kept doing research but funding in obstetric violence is less it's not that as a you know new researcher you can just jump into uh, research for that and uh, find the money to do it but i did get an opportunity uh, when i was doing my masters in public health and this was the thing that had been bothering me so i thought that's the most obvious thing i would like to study and although um i was not really looking for an answer to disrespect and abuse, I just wanted to find a way which makes childbirth a little more bearable. And I used to see all these, you know, pictures and even in movies where I only used to see like, you know, white couples. And I would see that the man is actually holding the woman's hand when she is in labor. And like they are in these large tubs of water. And it's like, what is happening here? That was such cultural shock for me but then thinking about it it's also like that would probably help me as well if i wanted to give birth because this is also around the time when us student midwives we were observing this and we're like we are never going through something like that we would rather go for an elective cesarean or never give birth uh, to a point i now understand and i have known for a while that i suffer from something called secondary tocophobia um, i have never given birth and I uh, do not plan to and no matter how many different reasons I find about environment and uh, this and that but I know deep down uh, watching as much obstetric violence has had a very deep impact on me as a person and on my choices of whether I would like to give birth or not but women I, I interviewed at that time this is in 2012 they reported that actually you know they want their husband to be there as a protector so that nobody disrespects and abuse them so that was quite shocking and that also made some kind of uh, grassroots uh, you know uh, understanding for me to understand what am i going to do in my phd so i'm going to take a leap forward by like seven eight years and this is um, this is the picture that I thought I wanted to talk about positionality and I was like a picture that represents my current status the best is what I thought this is I feel I'm kind of juggling life on my stomach <laughs> balancing multiple things but uh, jokes about I am 34 year old woman I am divorced I um, like I said have never given birth and I never plan to and the kind of birthing stories I have heard from around the world has had a lot of impact on me, on how I experience um, childbirth and the stories as well. And um, there has been a change in scenario. All my uh, life I had been in India and um, I am in the UK right now just to do my PhD. So. Uh, this is my first proper uh, international migration experience, I guess. Um, and in the PhD, I wanted to study all that you are seeing on the screen because I wanted to understand not just the woman's perspective, the midwife's perspective as well, because those were the two main voices I felt were lacking in the research we were doing in India in terms of leadership, in terms of being a stakeholder, everything. And my supervisors, um, then uh, Zoe Matthews and Sabu Padmadas, and later uh, Jane Sandal at King's College London as well, they felt I was trying to do uh, around six PhDs together. And they were quite brave to accept me as a student. So um, 
in the first bit of the PhD, I went to uh, three different countries and um, India at the state level, at national level. I was in the United Kingdom already. So I spoke with international experts, midwifery leaders here, and also in Switzerland because all the uh, main health policy making uh, UN bodies and their headquarters are mainly in this uh, in Switzerland, Geneva. And I went and asked all these senior midwifery leaders at you know three different contexts, what do you think you know will uh, change uh, care for women? And I wanted to understand what drives obstetric violence and what drives respectful care. But this, like I have been saying again and again, is not an issue that you can quickly start talking about. You cannot, especially care providers, you cannot just some suddenly ask, you know, about obstetric violence. Are you seeing it in your workplace? Do you think you have engaged in it? Do you see your colleagues engaging in it? So visual methods then come in handy. This particular painting by Shomi, it was something me and her, we observed in a labor room um, in India. And she, a midwife herself, she painted it and I used it as a, a visual method, as a, you know, a flyer to show it to these uh, nursing and midwifery leaders to ask their opinion on what is happening. How do you perceive her experiences? And although most of them kind of felt it is, you know, showing extreme forms of disrespect and abuse, but many found uh, parts of respectful care in that as well. And they felt these are all the situations, all the things with the woman, with the nurse midwife in their immediate environment and at the policy environment that needs to change if care has to improve for these women. But most importantly, they thought that listening to women's experiences and expectations is key for a midwifery model for women-centered care. So that's what I did next. I went to talk to women in a state called Bihar in India. It has a population of uh, 104 uh, million people. And it's important to understand a context of violence in general, because in some parts of the country, as it is in the world, um, intimate partner violence is more. Some people have been uh, sexually harassed. Um, like here you are seeing 40% of the women have experienced spousal violence. Uh, and this is a statewide survey. 3% have experienced violence during pregnancy. And just below that, 8% uh, of the girls who were interviewed between 18 to 29 years of age had already experienced sexual violence by the age of 18. So when you talk to women with history of violence and without asking them it's always there is a need to ask them in a way that does not further traumatize them that helps them open up in a way where they are taking the lead to tell you as much as they want to tell you and you are not asking them sensitive question directly which might uh, further traumatize them and that is something i have been trying to do for all these years in india and in different parts of india and Sometimes I come across these experiences where this is this is a Dai who's also called a traditional midwife in India. And she is showing me how she gave birth. And she was saying, I was just, you know, sweeping the floor on my knees. And then suddenly I felt the baby is coming out. And this woman came from the neighborhood and she is holding me the way she was held. And I have no idea what to say about this position or how to write it down. So that is the limitation of written language when you do not have these ideas and you go somewhere with that lack of language. It's We often say it's a limitation of language of the participant, but it's actually more of the researcher or the person who's interviewing who does not have the language to explain this. So then began the evolution of birth mapping. What I could not record on my body then went on to be looking like a gingerbread um, on my notepad because certain parts of the body, uh, it's difficult to uh, engage with women to talk about. So you show it on your notepad, okay, what was happening, where? And then I came across something called body mapping, which I tried uh, before doing my main data collection in the third picture you're seeing. And finally, the final picture you're seeing is something called birth mapping um, that I will be telling you more about. 
but this is the main process how it happens it's it begins on a plain sheet of paper and you carry as much art based material as you feel the need for there are some rules that need to, you need to follow like i go with the question on how did you give birth like being in a position in which you give birth and that is the only point where the participant is a little passive very where, where the facilitator kind of draws an outline out you know around her body and after that it's a completely participatory method um even many of these women had never uh, held a pen before some of them were completely illiterate but but still slowly that confidence came in when you know you meet them again and again and this is quite a lengthy process i met them several times over a week and i uh, you know the trust developed the stories got more detailed and this was done with four women in a, a rural village rural villages in bihar and uh, four women in urban slums even though they are all in the same state there is still quite a bit of diversity that you will see and although i will not get into the analysis details but i just want to tell you how beautiful the feminist relational discourse analysis is and how completely complex it is but as you analyze it it just opens up the data and makes you absorb and see and listen and feel it like i have never um, analyzed data before it also helps you use these arts based method in a very very uh, you know uh, good way and some of the products of uh, analysis i will uh, show you in a bit but yes the process is quite challenging because these are low income settings space is an issue so it's it's a life size sheet right so like 7 feet long so it's it was quite difficult to find space and to also get women's time uh, for like 2 to 3 hours every time we went there but they always found time and we always tried to work around their schedules that kind of work these are the eight women and even though it's eight but actually it's it's very diverse and each person's story is what really matters in terms of age education occupation birth setting they're all very different and it shows in how they experience their birth the aspects that they feel uh, in their childbirth were good were bad something they expect and that is what we need to focus on is the point of this research that every individual's experience matters um here are a few of the body maps but i will quickly go to um three and this one is a very you know proper thematic uh, analysis a traditional way of understanding and you will notice i have not started my presentation or i did not introduce any definition or typology or terminology uh, anything from literature because i wanted to only focus on these women's stories and what respectful care is for them so this one for example is a definition that amrita who you see in the birth map beside the definition says so for her she says care should be like when i told them what problem i have they should come and check me completely and tell me about my condition that in how much time i will deliver i will feel respectful when they will do my delivery on time without delay when they will speak with me politely with a smile when they will take care of me nicely if they gave me a bed they should treat us like family members no matter whether i am giving birth to a boy or a girl i should be treated well they should talk to me nicely no matter whether it is a nurse doctor or dai they should give immunization injection medicines and other supplies from hospital then only we will share our good experience with other women in the neighborhood that we are not disrespected there and people are not greedy what's the point of going there otherwise there are two other forms that come out of this analysis that i'm uh, particularly keen to talk about something called an i poem which you create by filtering out sentences where that the participant begins with an i and this is a particular section and even the title has been taken from uh, urmila's narrative so here urmila is uh, describing about uh, her episiotomy experience the poem is called the lady doctor was really nice 
I told her not to do it, but she forced her hand in me. I told her, don't put your hand in me because it was hurting. But they continued to do so, didn't listen to me. I was so angry with the doctor because she called me so many times for vaginal checkups. Every time she told me the passage did not open. I didn't like it. I was shouting and crying due to pain, but still doctor kept on suturing. I asked them for behoshi ki dawa, anesthesia, but they were not listening to me and kept doing it. I thought my problems are over after giving birth, but the real challenge was post birth. I was screaming. The doctor and sisters were holding me down from all sides and kept stitching me. I felt all of it. I kept screaming and asking for anesthesia. I felt all of it. I didn't have such pain in my first delivery while stitching. I liked the behavior of my doctor and one of the nurses. I didn't like those two frowning sisters who shouted at me. The way women share their stories um it's not always one kind of voice and that is what came out in this very detailed and complex analysis something we call contrapuntal voices and this framework it's coming out in a publication soon um uses the language of music where you see it's not always a, a voice of sorrow or pain or silence there is the voice of anger, desirability, resistance, triumph, happiness, all of it. And that you understand when you listen and re-listen the, uh, the audio recordings and you read again and again the transcript that you have. Something that you will get a little idea of when I read Pero's birthing story. Um, it's going to take me around uh, five minutes, but I request that you look at Pero's birthing map on the side when you listen to me read her story. My heart was beating out of my chest because I knew what was going to happen next. He held my hand tightly, a stranger, but it felt good. As if someone my own is keeping me calm. Scared, I asked him to press his hand on my chest, on my heart. I'm 29 years old, government school teacher, and this was my second childbirth a year ago. Memories of my first birth had traumatized me. Everything is still fresh in my mind. Even now, when I think about it, I just know, never again. I wasn't in pain, but I was leaking some fluid. So everyone took me to the government hospital that morning. There were many women all waiting for their turn. But then I saw that doctor wearing a plastic glove checking everyone in that dirty environment. I ran from there. I was taken to a private hospital next. The lady doctor just made the nurse lift my petticoat and nighty up and forced her hand inside me without any explanation. I started screaming and crying out of pain. You can never have a normal birth if you cannot bear this pain. The next three days, I was in observation when I was given 19 bottles of fluids, many injections to increase the labor pain and numerous vaginal examinations. The nurses would just come and insert their hand, not even minding the crowd and how many people are around me. I was frustrated and complained to the doctor. Why does everyone has to first insert a hand in me without even talking to me? Is there no other way to check? She said nothing. My mother says, women have to endure that to have a child. Even now, sometimes I tell mommy, that wasn't right. I was in the cafeteria with my family when the nurse came and just dragged me by my hand to the operation theater. No explanation given. My family stayed outside the OT. There were eight men in the room, all in regular clothes, like they're on a picnic. One of them said, get up, gave me an injection on my back and made me lie down. No explanation given again. That's when I realized I'm going to get operated. No one told me. My only solace was that there won't be any labor pain. Another man blindfolded me because the less I see, the less uncomfortable I will be. I felt someone was taking my petticoat off and lifting my nighty to my chest. They were treating me like a doll or like an animal, doing whatever they want, not caring about me at all, like I did not exist. I was filthy and my hair tangled without a shower in four days, my clothes getting drenched in my fluid and drying on me. I did not know anyone in that room. I asked about my lady doctor to this other guy who was apparently her son. She arrived later. 
They played music in the OT. It was calming. There were other sounds too, of instruments and scissors cutting through me like they are cutting a juke rag. Everyone was talking amongst themselves while they took the girl out of my body. It's a girl, they discussed, and I thought I will tie her hair in two ponytails and take her to school with me. I stayed in the hospital for 10 days after that because I had fever and chills and was recovering from surgery. Meanwhile, the baby's doctor did not tie my baby's cord properly, which kept bleeding. She got infection the same night and my husband had to take her to another hospital three kilometers away every day for injections. I struggled to breastfeed her and even hold her properly. I cried when I couldn't have a normal birth the second time with my son two years later. The doctor pressed on the incision and it hurt. It can get torn and you might get a cut down there anyways. You need a big operation, she said. The normal birth's pain lasts four days, but the misery of cesarean section lasts for years and breaks your body. In the beginning, sometimes the incision used to hurt like someone dropped chili powder on it. For the medicine, I was prescribed to apply on it to get rid of the pain and redness in the first place. This was a quack in our village who considers himself our area's doctor. My husband asks, why did you not get sterilized if you don't want another child? You get sterilized, I tell him. He makes excuses that he'll get weak, so we both don't get it done. But I do tease him saying my life is in your hands when we get intimate. I feel I needed to share these with someone. It all needed to come out as I could not talk about it with anyone. That day somehow got over, but those haunting memories have stayed with me. And I hope you could hear some of these contrapuntal voices that I have been talking about. So in conclusion, I think about all these narratives that you're hearing, the point is about listening and learning. As you will see, many people are saying the same thing. And to do that, we also need to go through a process of unlearning. So while I'm listening and learning, I'm also kind of taking it forward and passing it on by uh, writing about it, publishing about it, presenting in conferences, getting uh, platforms like this to share women's stories. I am also writing furiously about uh, the sexism, the patriarchy, the political nature of this problem that exists. I take up activism every chance I get. And this is a picture from uh, the What Women Want campaign. I had led that in the United Kingdom, which is one of those 114 countries. And to create more awareness and to make people more comfortable and more aware about obstetric violence as a problem, and so they acknowledge and talk about it to address it, I started the Obstetric Violence Journal Club, which is on Twitter, and I would love for you to join it. The link is right there. And lastly, there is something called a birth and body book club that I also run, where I talk about literature from around the world on birth and body. Because during my PhD, I had felt there is kind of an inequality or inequity, and the, the global birth literature was kind of dominant from global north, and there was not much narrative from the global south that was coming in. So I'm trying to bring a balance on that. The book club exists on Twitter and Facebook. And I have realized that I mostly talk about obstetric violence even now in the book club, given my PhD. But that will change soon. So with that, thank you very much. My Twitter ID is there. If you are taking selfies, I hope you still have the energy to do that. Please do tag me on that. And I hope we break all the Twitter selfie records of VITM going forward. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Kaveri, that almost leaves me speechless. Now is time for, yeah, look at the comments. Wow, how inspiring. Um, this, your work is an emotionally heavy and emotionally burdening type of work. And, I, and I'm so grateful that you have the strength to do it and to talk with us today about it. Um, we can take questions from the participants. Um, you can write them in the chat box if you'd like to ask a question. 
You can unmute your microphone. I see Jane and Carlene are typing. Yeah, Jane says you are so brave and so <laughs> she's so grateful you have the strength for this. Thank you. Those are those are beautiful words. I'm going to copy this chat <laughs> and keep it wherever I feel down. But thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, we will have a, a copy, Kaveri, and we'll send it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a question for Kaveri? This works yes, needs Jane. some time to sink in, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah it, it takes time to feel that and yeah. then gather yourself so that you can ask yeah. a question. I saw Jane wanted to ask a question. I know you talked about the Global South, but uh, the Global North is also suffering uh, obstetrical violence, both in, in personal observations and professional observations, uh, specifically in my family and also with women of colour that I've cared for in uh, the United States of America. And I, was, uh, I would just really like to ask, how do we start when, I, when I've tried to address this uh, with uh, the powers that be, the obstetricians, the midwives. Uh, it's I'm, I'm referred to that this is normal education for obstetricians, that they need to do an unnecessary forceps, they need to do a vacuum that's not required uh, because this is required as part of uh, some kind of training. And I was just wondering, how, how do we start uh, addressing this uh, need both within our families uh, personally and within professional settings. And thank you so much for uh, beginning this conversation. Thank you so much for that question. Um, we have to first understand that this is um, a complex problem and there is no easy solution. And I think the beginning would be to acknowledge that it exists and there is quite a bit of denial amongst the healthcare uh, workers community right now as well. And uh, amongst people who are suffering through this as well, they sometimes don't wanna you know, talk about it because you're talking about your healthcare provider. In some cases, they are the only healthcare providers available in the whole community who will take care of your children, who will take care of your the elderly in your family. So you do not want to be the reason for that healthcare worker who has probably agreed to be in the remote area. To be taken away. Um, I, I showed a slide which had which had like this framework. It talks about the drivers, and it talks about all the things related to the nurse midwife and the woman. I mentioned about these two people because they are the key stakeholders in birth. And you look at their personal uh, attributes. You look at their immediate environment-related attributes, and you look at the context, the larger context. So when you look at that, that only gives you a few bullets, but it's like a comprehensive list. You can think of the context of the area you work in or the country you are a part of. There is no one solution which can be replicated immediately in another uh, country. Even in India, it's so diverse. I think we'll struggle to, you know, we have to find a solution in every uh, area, every community we go to. But it kind of helps you to plan and see what are the levels where changes have to be made, who are the stakeholders you need to engage with. And listening to women in the process again and again to understand that change is the most important. And one traditional way of training that has even in India and most lower income countries, we see that whatever problem we see, we start training midwives, we start training nurses, we add more to the curriculum. I don't think that's a solution. If the point is about sexism, if the point is about patriarchy, if it is uh, the context that needs to be addressed, you need to enable the environment and make it possible for them to flourish. And sometimes for that, you have to target people who are on top of the power ladder first. You have to target the doctors, you have to uh, target uh, policymakers, politicians, people who hold that power to make space for them to move out. Only then will 
uh, people we are you know wanting to listen to will come out i'm sorry that was a very long answer um i'm looking somebody was asking there are so many comments somebody was asking about the links to the journal the links to the digital journal links to the digital journal digital journal I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going back a slide. And, and maybe that was it, Kaveri. Maybe the Journal Club. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the this is the uh, book club link, and this is the Journal Club uh, on Twitter. If you find me on Twitter, then everything is there on my bio there, all the links. So that is an easy one. Um. Any any more questions, Carlene? Oh, was somebody speaking? No, I was. <laughs> okay. Uh, Carlene asked, can you consider how to create partnerships with physician champions? Um, absolutely. I feel we have this example of Evita Fernandez in India, who is just so genuinely honest about you know her kind of training as an obstetrician in india and her practice and then the process of understanding the harm uh, there is in that and i'm not just saying about uh, medical education but but those aspects of um you know uh, patriarchy and colonialism you you see that uh, in the nursing and midwifery curriculum as well and you know she she talks about unlearning and then learning this whole process of how to collaborate how it can be a teamwork and that collaboration is also something where interventions should be targeted because when you target interventions just at midwives somewhere it also makes it look like we are the part of the problem like I'm the only abuser in this facility that you see a problem and you're only targeting the nurses. The team approach will include everyone who is going to be a part of care provision so that they can all ensure that care is respectful in whatever role they are playing in the care provision for that person. But I think honest communication respectfulness within team members is the first thing that needs to be you know looked into if you do not have respectful communication and a respectful relationship within your team it's kind of like a domino effect you you abuse the one who's next in the hierarchy so even way before that we you need to address the birthing environment and the relationships uh there before we even talk about approaching women Thank you, Kaveri. Um, there's also a question about your I poems. Are they reproduced anywhere? Um, well, uh, well, they are under review right now. They are accepted in a journal, and that framework about the contrapuntal voices and uh, with I poems, it's all coming in one publication. Uh, but but it's it's under review right now. But it is coming out, and I will shout out on all my social media platforms when it does. Carlene, I know you were trying to speak. Were all the questions you wanted answered addressed? Carlene's microphone is on, but we're not getting any sound. I see a different question from Katie. Ah, okay. Should I should I take Yeah, Katie? yeah, please, Kavari. Um it, it says I think Katie's saying when respect is so important, why are we still using the word delivered? Thanks for pointing that out. That is something that I kind of say in all my meetings in all the reports in you know the the professional work that i do 
Um, and I kind of now take a strict approach that, you know, I personally don't use the word delivered unless the participant has used it, then I insert it, even in the translation, like in the Indian context. We say the word delivery very easily, even people who do not speak English at all. Some of these words are there in our vocabulary. Delivery is that word. And I think it obviously seeped in from, you know, the care providers, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives, us using the word delivery so often that has gone into their vocabulary. But even when I review papers and I always encourage people that we, we cannot say that we have to say birth and not just that I will mention this particular commentary in Lancet that came out very recently I think a couple of months back it it says something the title is something about mind your language and it's not an exhaustive list but it kind of gives a table and shows that some of these languages that are being used um, in in the birthing settings and an alternate better uh, example that can be used and but again, when it comes to language, this change is based on context. So in your own language, you will find there are some of these uh, words and terminologies or ways of approaching people that are you know, quite uh, bad. And um, you need to find alternative in your own language and more respectful ways of communicating. Absolutely. But thanks for bringing that out.